وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We begin as always with the praise of Allah Azza wa Jal We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to exalt the mention and grant peace to our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to his family and his companions We are talking about the rights of the husband, the rights of the wife and we are right in the middle of a discussion on the husband spending upon his wife and we'd spoken about the first right which is the right of the mahar the right of the spending upon the wife uh, for the mahar at the time of marriage and the time that they first become alone together in a situation in which intimacy can occur and that that, that the, that's where the right of a nafaqa begins the right of the mahar we now come to a hadith narrated by al imam muslim an abi hurairah radiyallahu an the prophet sallam he said a dinar that you spend for the sake of Allah, i.e. Uh, jihad fi sabilillah, uh, you spend to prepare the Muslim army or to support the Muslim army, a dinar that you spend freeing a slave, a dinar that you give in sadaqah to a poor person, and a dinar you spend upon your family. Then the Prophet Sallallahu he said, أَعْظَمُهَا ajra, The greatest in reward. So let me ask you to pause the video. Which one of those has the biggest reward? Dinar. A dinar. So a single gold coin that you give. You, one of those coins, it goes fi sabilillah. One of it, it goes to free a slave. One of it, it goes to a poor person. And one of it, it goes to feed your family. It goes to spend upon your family. Not necessarily to feed them, to spend upon them. Their clothing, their food rent, whatever. Which of those is the greatest in the sight of Allah? What do you think? So inshallah, you pause the video, had a think. The Prophet ﷺ said, The one that is the greatest reward is the one you spent upon your family. And it seems, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best, that one of the reasons for this is that spending upon the family, as we said, is an obligation upon the person. Whereas the others could all be voluntary, uh, in a, to a certain extent and the the fisa bilillah uh, here it can be a voluntary contribution the uh, dinar that a person gives to a poor person can be a voluntary contribution the dinar in freeing a slave can be a voluntary contribution but the obligation of spending upon the family is one which is very serious in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal and Al-Bukhari and Muslim narrated from Abi Mas'ud البدر رضي الله عن عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه قال إذا أنفق الرجل على أهله نفقة وهو يحتسبها كانت له صدقة. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said if a man spends upon his family and he is expecting the reward for that it will be a صدقة for him. And Abi Huraira radiallahu an narrated the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said مَا مِنْ يَوْمٍ يُصْبِحُ الْعِبَادُ فِيهِ إِلَّا مَلَكَانِ يَنْزِلَانِ فَيَقُولُ أَحَدُهُمَا أَلَّهُمَّ أَعْطِي مُنْفِقًا أَلَّهُمَّ أَعْطِي مُنْفِقًا خَلَفًا وَيَقُولُ الْآخَرُ أَلَّهُمَّ أَعْطِي مُمْسِكًا تَلَفًا Abi Huraira radiallahu an narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said there is no day in which the servants wake up in the morning or reach the morning, except that there are two angels that come down. One of them says, O oh Allah, give the one that spends, the one who spends infaq, give the one who spends a replacement for what he spends. And another angel says, O oh Allah, give the one who withholds, doesn't spend upon his family, Talafa, make his, his wealth destroyed or make it ruin, give him ruin, ruin him. SubhanAllah, that is also not only talking about the reward, we talked about the reward of giving, the fact that it's a sadaqa, the fact that it is a'zam ajara, it's, it's, it's the a'zamuha ajara indallah, the biggest 
of reward in the sight of Allah. But look at what these two angels say. And the munfiq here, it can be all kinds of nafaqah because it's a general word. But from the most from the most important of the nafaqat of the spending is the spending of a man upon his wife. And these two angels, they come down and one of them says, Oh Allah, the one who spends, give him khalafa. In other words, replace his wealth, replenish his wealth for him. And the one who withholds, ruin him. Ruin him and ruin his wealth. And subhanAllah, that could be a reason why a person's wealth is restricted. Because they are not spending upon the people that it is wajib for them to spend upon, such as their wife, their children, and their parents, and so on. And they're not spending upon the people that they that it's wajib upon them to spend upon. So Allah Azza wa Jal brings them ruin in their wealth. And that could be like a loss of wealth or bankruptcy or poverty that comes to them. Or, or telef can also be when something is ruined. You know, you had good wealth, like you had crops and they got disease and they they became uh, they they became ruined and they became lost. Subhanallah. Or you had money and that money was stolen. All of these things are things that could happen because a person doesn't take responsibility for the nafaqat, the things that they are supposed to spend. Our next hadith is a hadith narrated by Hakim ibn Mu'awiyah al-Qushayri an abihi radiyallahu anhu qala qultu ya Rasulallah ma haqqu zawjati ahadina alayh He said radiyallahu anhu O Messenger of Allah, what is the right of one of our wives over us. One of our wives, what right does she have over us? The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith is narrated by Abi Dawood, he said, أَن تُطَعِمَهَا إِذَا طَعِمْتَ وَتَكْسُوهَا إِذَا إِذَكْ تَسَيْتَ Or he said, إِذَكْ تَسَبْتَ وَلَا تَضْرِبِ الْوَجْهِ وَلَا تُقَبِّحْ وَلَا تَهْجُرْ إِلَّا فِي الْبَيْتِ he said, her right over you is that you feed her when you feed yourself. And you clothe her when you clothe yourself, or he said, when you earn. When you clothe yourself or when you earn. And that you don't strike her on the face and that you don't say horrible words to her. You don't say to her horrible words. And you don't abandon her, i.e. turn away from her, except within the house. There are a number of rights here. We wanted to highlight, obviously, the issue of a nafaqa. That the definition here is very beautifully laid out here. That when you feed yourself, you feed her. And we spoke in the hadith, right back in the beginning of the series, in the hadith of Um Zar, about the man who she said about her husband, that إِذَا أَكَلَ لَفَّ that when he eats, he sweeps up the whole plate. He takes everything on the plate. When he eats, he takes everything on the plate. That's different from what the Prophet said. When you eat, you feed her. So maybe the man doesn't have enough food for the family all the time, but if his wife's not eating, he's not eating. And if he's eating, his wife's eating. And when he gets clothes for himself, he gets clothes. He gets clothes for her, and clothes are different from place to place. Definitely among uh, the Arabs in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, it might be the case that you had many times material that could be used for a man or woman, uh, in the sense it would be worn differently, or it would be different things could be made from it. But many materials could be used for either. Some were only for women, like the red, uh, the, the 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 red material that we have in the hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an and others. But in here, uh, clothes could be different for different cultures, different situations, you know. But at the end of the day, when he gets clothes for himself, he thinks of his wife. Does she need clothes? And he gets her what she needs. Or the hadith is that he gets clothes for her when he earns. I, when he brings money in, he has some extra money. He looks at whether she needs some clothing and he buys clothes for her. Now, when it comes for a nafaqat, we said that they're defined by al-urf, by what is customary, and they're defined no doubt by need. You know, because ultimately, it's not about him buying extra and extra and extra all the time. That is ihsan, that is, that is an act of excellence towards his wife, to buy her extra clothes, extra food, extra kindness. We talked about this in the hadith of Umzar uh, regarding 
the, the husband who spent upon her until her ears were heavy with jewelry and so on. This is ihsan, this is an act of excellence towards the wife. However, looking at her need, and that's why when the scholars talk about nafaqat, they talk about spending upon the family members, they look at the need. Different family members need things at different times. Sometimes your children need things, sometimes one needs something, the other one doesn't need something. And that's why in a nafaqa, it's not always the case that there has to be uh, a taswiyah, there has to be complete similarity, for example, between the different children in nafaqat, in spending, because it can sometimes be the case that one child needs something, the other one doesn't, and so on. Uh, and we're going to talk about a man with more than one wife that will come, inshallah, later on, because that's a, a special uh, case. But when it comes to an-nafaqat, spending upon uh, a wife or upon family members, then we look at the person's need, we look at what is customary, and we look at what the man has available to him. So these are three things that are kind of setting the scene for the husband spending upon his wife. The custom, which includes who he is, who she is, where they live, the time they live in. We look at the... Uh, situation of the husband in terms of his current financial situation and we look at the need of the wife what's she in need of what's important for her right now what does she need at this moment in time so these are all things to bear in mind uh, from the we had some excellent uh, characteristics mentioned by the prophet ﷺ that he doesn't hit her on the face and we know the prohibition in that generally and we're going to talk about hitting later on and he doesn't uh, speak evilly towards her or even uh, تقبح, could also refer to him belittling her in speech and making her feel low and uh, biting, but you know, biting her head off, like we had in the hadith of Umzar uh, that she said that she spoke, and she said that he didn't make this this uh, this kind of uh, statements about me. He didn't. I used to speak freely, and he would not find fault with me and uh, make me feel terrible or uh, say horrible things to me. These are all from this word. And the last etiquette, and this is very important, is that if he feels the need to abandon her, i.e. to distance himself from her, and that we're going to talk about in marital discord, inshallah ta'ala, this must be kept within the household. And Allah, Allah, how this is important this is, that this could be the one thing that could save a person's marriage. That when you fight, when you have arguments, when you're distant from each other, let it be filbate in the house. In fact, better than that, let it be in the room. Let it not spread to anyone, not the children, not the in-laws, not the world, and not Facebook and everybody else. Yani. Let it remain between the husband and between the wife. That when they have an argument, let neither side involve anyone else. Unless there is a shara'i reason to do so. And that is very rare, to be honest. Because the sharia doesn't advocate getting other people involved until quite late on in the process. And we're going to talk about the process of marital discord. But this, since it came up in the hadith, وَلَا تَهْجُرْ إِلَّا فِي الْبَيْتِ Don't let him abandon her except within the house so if there's some discord between them let it remain between them and why the husband and wife so quickly they forgive each other we made between you love and mercy so easily but once the mother-in-law is involved the sister-in-law is involved fulan is involved alan is involved the whole world knows about it it's very very hard for the marriage to recover after that it's not impossible, but it's very difficult and it puts a lot of obstacles in place. Let the hajar, let the distance and the issues and the fights and whatever happen privately between the husband and wife within the house. And Allah will bring them out of that with the mawadda and the rahmah, the love and the mercy that he put between them. So even though we're going to talk more about this inshallah ta'ala in the topic of marital discord, it's very important that it came in this hadith, so let's highlight it and let's, you know, sort of make sure that that message has reached everybody, inshallah ta'ala. We now have a hadith in Sahih Muslim from Jabir ibn Samurah, 
that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, إِذَا أَعْطَى اللَّهُ أَحَدَكُمْ خَيْرًا فَلْيَبْدَأْ بِنَفْسِهِ وَأَهْلِ بَيْتِهِ If Allah gives some good, i.e. money here, khair, it refers to wealth, uh, like the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, وَإِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْرِ لَشَدِيدٍ Indeed, he is towards the love of wealth, very strong. So al-khayr here, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best, it means al-mal. If Allah gives wealth to one of you, let him begin with himself and his family. Hul hadith fi sahih Muslim, the hadith is in sahih Muslim. Let him begin with himself and his family. And that is that at the end of the day, yes, we are a people of sadaqah. Zakah is a pillar from the pillars of Islam. And sadaqah is a sign from the signs and, and, and the sha'ir, the, the public open signs that define who Muslims are. But a person really truly believes that charity begins at home. Let him first of all look at his family. Do they need anything? Do they, have they a need for something? Can he do some ihsan to them by giving them something? And then let him look at the society and what the people need after that. And of course, he doesn't fall short in his zakah and his obligations, uh, but he looks to make sure that his family are covered. Then he looks outside because family is the first responsibility. Even in the zakah, and the zakah has rules about who you can and can't give it to. And broadly speaking, you can't give zakah to someone that it is obligatory for you to spend upon normally. So you can't give it to your wife because you're already obliged to spend upon her. And you can't give it to your child because you're already obliged to spend upon them. And you can't give it to a parent because you're already obliged to spend upon them. But you look to the family that you're not obliged to spend upon. It could be a sibling, cousin, whatever. And if they are in need of the zakah, then they are awla, they are more deserving of it. So you begin with yourself and your household and you look outwards like that. And that's not to, to encourage selfishness, but that's to uncover to make to make sure that to encourage to make sure that a person is home situation is settled and then they look out to give to the people outside of that. And that doesn't mean being excessive. Uh, you know, like Allah Azza just said, in al kanu ikhwana shayateen, the people who waste their wealth are the brothers of the shayateen, the brothers of the devils. It's not about being excessive, but it's about looking to make sure that their family are covered first and realizing that sadaqah starts at home. You know, that famous statement that everyone says charity begins at home, this hadith of Jabir ibn Samurah in Sahih Muslim is evidence for that. Let him begin with himself and let him begin with his household before he looks outwards to the other people that he would like to give to. Our next hadith, عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه أنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إني أحرج عليكم حق الطعيفين اليتيم والمرأة. This hadith is in uh, Al Hakim and others, and it is the hadith of Abi Hurairah that the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said that I, he emphasized strongly, he emphasized strongly that I am putting, it's like I'm putting pressure on you. I am conveying to you the seriousness of the right of the two weak ones, the orphan and the woman. So the Prophet ﷺ is warning the man not to fall short in the rights of his wife. And this is particularly, as we're going to speak about, the right of a nafaqa. Spending is one of the major rights that the man has to fulfill, major obligations that a man has to fulfill. The Prophet ﷺ, he took it seriously. He said, I'm going to convey to you the seriousness of the right of the two weak ones, the orphan and the woman. Meaning these are two people who typically, if the man uh, was not fearing Allah Azza wa Jal, it might be the case that he would see it to be something easy to oppress them. What's my wife going to say if I don't spend on her? What's she going to do? Where's she going to go? Who's she going to run away to? You know, so he might get that kind of attitude. So the Prophet made it very clear to him that this is a serious right and that there is a serious burden upon a person to look after the people who might otherwise not 
be able to get their rights. And this is important because a person might say, well, when the man's ahead of a household, does that not give him the ability to oppress his wife? Or does that not put him in a situation where he has the potential to abuse his responsibility? Yet the Prophet ﷺ emphasized the severity of this. And likewise, the orphan who also, without having a father, would be in a situation where he might be liable to people taking advantage of him. So don't take advantage of your wife in the nafaqat, in spending or in anything else. That's why we brought this particular this particular hadith in this particular place to warn against a dhulm and to warn against people taking it easy as it relates to spending. And more specifically, the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar in Sahih Muslim, He said that the Prophet ﷺ said, it is sufficient for a person as a sin to withhold from the one that he holds their provision and he's required to spend upon them. So she is waiting for him to give food for her. She's waiting for him to buy clothes for her. She's waiting for him to pay the rent or the, the bill for her house. And he holds that money back. That's enough of a sin for him. Meaning that sin could be the sin that takes him to Jahannam or Ayyadu Billah. Because he holds back his wealth from the ones that he is obliged to spend upon and the ones that are waiting for him to spend upon and expecting for him to spend upon. And the hadith is a very severe situation that a man withholds. Again, according to what his ability he has, we're not asking a man to spend from something that he doesn't have. But for him to withhold, and we have some men who are spending on things they don't need for themselves, for other things they don't need. And they're not taking care of the people who are expecting them to spend upon them. So that matter is quite a serious situation. And uh, Aisha radiallahu anha, she narrated in the hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. She said, دَخَلَتْ هِنْدْ بِنْتُ عُتْبَةِ إِمْرَأَةُ أَبِي سُفْيَانِ على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقالت يا رسول الله إن أبا سفيان رجل شحيح عائشة said that Hind bint Utba the wife of Abi Sufyan she entered upon the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم and she said oh messenger of Allah Sufyan is a man who is stingy لا يعطيني من النفقة ما يكفيني ويكفي بنية إلا ما أخذت من ماله بغير علمه she said he doesn't give me enough spending for what suffices me and my children, except if I take it from his wealth without his permission or without his knowledge. So do I, is there any blame upon me if I take from his wealth without his knowledge because he doesn't give me enough to suffice myself and my children? Uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, take from his wealth bil ma'roof, according to custom, according to what is good and what is customary, what is enough for you and your children. Don't take more than what you're allowed, what is normal, but you can take from his wealth. He's just holding it back, he's not giving it. Take from his wealth what is enough for you and your children bil ma'roof. So the situation is so serious that a woman is even allowed to take. So, and then an example of that, let me give an example which, so we don't misunderstand the woman is going in and taking from the husband's wallet just money and spending left, right and center. This is a situation where the basic needs are not being met. She needs to pay for food and he's not giving it. He has the money. It's not that he's not eating himself. He has the money. But he's like, oh, look, I'm not going to give it to you. I have other things I might need it for, whatever. She goes she buys the basic necessities that are normal for her, for her children, and she pays with her husband's money. And he comes back and says, well, I didn't give you permission for this. She said, well, I asked you, you didn't give me what was enough for myself, for the children, which is the basic needs that we have. For them, the issue is, is that serious, yani, that she's, even though she's not normally allowed to do so, if he is withholding the money, the nafaqa, the spending, to the extent that the basic needs are not being met, then that is a matter where she can go and she can take that. But I would recommend in this that a sister in this situation should ask the people of knowledge about her situation because people's understanding of this might lead them to go overboard 
and take from the husband's money without even having a right in the sight of Allah جل, because she, her idea of what is a norm it might be way too much and a husband, she might not be taking into account a husband's needs and a husband's situation financially so she should ask and make sure like Hind uh, anha, asked the Prophet وسلم, about it so she should also ask the people of knowledge about it to be careful that she doesn't go over the limits that are set by Allah جل, in that we now come to the issue of uh, the the provision of accommodation and this is something very important in the religion of Islam and is something which causes a great deal of issues in a marriage and this is in the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal and the ayah in Surah uh, At-Talaq ayah number 6 in which Allah Azza wa Jal said Askinuhunna min haythu sakantum min wujdikum Let them live from where you yourselves live, out of the provision that you have. So here Allah commands for a man to provide accommodation for his wife. Again, we're going to say about accommodation, the same thing that we said about a nafaqa, generally spending in general, that it goes back to al-urf, it goes back to what is normal, what is expected, the norms and expectations of the society, the kind of woman she is, the kind of man that he is, what resources he has available, what she needs and so on. However, one of the rights and the madhab of the jumhur, jumhur al-ulama, from the Hanafiya and the Shafi'iya and the Hanabila and others, the, the madhab of the majority of the ulama is that a woman has the right to her own private accommodation and this is an area where so many issues have happened and that is because in many cultures it is expected for a woman to live with her in-laws now it's not haram for a woman to live with her in-laws but the basic principle in Islam is that she has a right to her own house and her own accommodation according to what is customary. If she agrees to forgo that and she is happy to live with her in-laws, there is no issue here. But there has been a culture of what can only be described as mass enslavement of wives who become literally slaves, like an amma, like a slave to her mother-in-law. She literally waits on her mother-in-law hand and foot and the husband sees it that he has the right to just forgo his responsibility towards his mother and don't he doesn't look at what his mother's needs are but he expects that his wife will do that and that she will live with the mother-in-law and there, this is something which as we said while the concept is not necessarily haram and while a wife should assist her husband in birr al-walidain in looking after his parents the issue here is extreme in many cases rather a wife has the right to her own accommodation and that is the opinion of the vast majority of the scholars of Islam so the solution is give everyone who has a right over you their right so if she asks for her own accommodation, let the husband strive hard and work hard to get her her own accommodation. It could be next door to his parents so that it's easy for him to go and do Birr al and her to go and support him in that. And there's nothing wrong with that, rather that's part of obedience to her husband, there's nothing wrong with that. But what we see is in this is that many people go to extremes which are from and from the most severe examples of a dhulm, of oppression and that the husband doesn't take any care to stop his family from oppressing his wife or his wife from oppressing his family and he loses control of the situation for what is obligatory upon him is to fear Allah with regard to everyone with regard to his mother, with regard to his father with regard to his household, with regard to his wife to give each one their right and for him to see his responsibility as being the primary one and then his wife's responsibility. So he should give her own accommodation if she wishes. If she's happy to live with the in-laws, there's nothing wrong with that inshallah ta'ala if she's happy with that. And he should provide her some privacy in that situation as much as is 
possible. And if she changes her mind, she has the right to ask for her own accommodation, but she should be patient with her husband. And this is the balance. She should be patient with him. She should uh, wait, understanding that it's gonna take some time for him to do that. She should be willing for the house if it needs to be nearby to where the parents are. And she should be helping along with his parents to serve him by serving his parents. And there's no harm in that, inshallah. But let it not reach an extreme because of zulmu, zulumat yawm al-qiyamah, that oppression is a darkness on the day of resurrection. And none of us want to have that oppression uh, or, or to, to be from those people who oppress others, as in the hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah, the hadith in Sahih Muslim, that the Prophet said, فَإِنَّ He said that ظلم, oppression is a darkness, يوم القيامة. It is a darkness, يوم القيامة. So it's a very serious, a very serious uh, matter. We're going to cover one more matter, inshaAllah ta'ala, before we conclude, and it's still on the topic of an nafaqa وعن أبي هريرة عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه قال من كانت له امرأتان فمال إلى أحدهما جاء يوم القيامة وشقه مائل أبي هريرة narrated in the hadith is in Abi Dawood from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم that whoever has two wives and he inclines towards one of them he will come on the day of judgment with one of his sides Ma'il, like it's leaning down or it's uh, like one side of him is is twisted, it's not it's not straight, it's it's not like he's not equally proportioned Yom Al-Qiyamah. One of his sides is hanging down because he was not fair between his wives. So there's no doubt that Islam has given a man permission to marry more than one wife with certain conditions and certain rules and regulations. And the one that we want to cover right here is that he should be fair as regards to his time and as regards to his spending. Time and spending. As for his heart and his love and which one he loves more, either any is a matter that's not really in his control. And it's not something Allah will punish him for. But he should be equal as it relates to time and money. So the Prophet ﷺ loved Aisha radiallahu anha out of his wives that he had. Uh, after Khadija radiallahu anha, he loved Aisha more than any of them. And that's why when he was asked, who do you love the most? He said, Aisha. And then they said, from among the men. And he said, her father, Abu Bakr radiallahu an. So ultimately, the Prophet ﷺ loved Aisha like that. And even though his other wives were there, he said to Aisha that, I'm like you, I am towards you like like Abu Zar was to Umm Zar. And some of the scholars, al Hafid ibn Hajar, he mentioned that he said this in front of all of his the, the co-wives. So the matters of the heart is not uh, a matter that a man can control. But time and money is what a man is required to be fair in. And that's why, as it relates to time, he's not allowed to stay with one wife in the time that is for the other wife. And he's not also allowed to be unfair in his spending upon them. So here, this is where we brought it, is as it relates to the right of spending, that if he has more than one wife, that he should be fair and he should not be leaning towards one over the other as it relates to the issue of spending. So that's what we have time for in this episode, inshallah ta'ala. We're now going to come on to the rights that are obligations of the woman and her rights towards the husband, because we spent this time talking about the nafaqa, the man spending upon his wife. There are others, but we're just going to try and take them like that, like a bit from here and a bit from there. So we're now going to look at how the how the wife approaches the obligations towards the husband after we spoke about the husband obligation of spending and providing accommodation and the related rules around that we're now going to talk about the wife and her obligations towards her husband and inshallah we will cover more of the husband's obligations and the wife's obligations as we go through the course inshallah ta'ala that's what allah made easy for me to mention and allah knows best was salat was salam ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in assalamu alaikum if you're enjoying these videos and you'd like to keep up to date with all of the courses we're going to be running make sure you head over to amauathome.com